Welcome to the Introduction to Wraparound Facilitation. This series of online learning modules provides an introduction to care coordination using the Wraparound Practice Model in alignment with the National Wraparound Initiative. This model is a primary component of a coordinated, community-based, family-driven, and youth-guided system of care. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration provided a four-year system of care expansion grant to the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services in 2013, focused on youth and young adults, those ages 14 through 21. As part of the expansion effort, developing the infrastructure and capacity for wraparound as part of a system of care in Ohio was targeted. In order to support the ongoing development and understanding of wraparound in Ohio, the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services awarded a digital training grant in 2017 to the Butler County Family and Children First Council to create learning modules that demonstrate practices in effectively facilitating wraparound with fidelity to national wraparound initiative principles and model in order to assist others across the state in replicating this model in their local areas. These modules focus on providing an introduction to the National Wraparound Initiative Practice Model, wraparound facilitation skills and competencies to implement the model, and links to further resources for the learner about wraparound practices. The Butler County Family and Children First Council partnered with the Center for School-Based Mental Health Programs at Miami University to produce the digital content. Please push the forward arrow on the bottom right to advance to the next slide. We begin with Module 1, Why Wraparound? Oftentimes when families identify that they need help, social service providers try to figure out what is wrong and then how to address the problem. If a youth is struggling in school, they may try a behavior chart and point system. If he is arguing a lot with his parents, they may suggest anger management classes. These strategies may be helpful, but they could be just the tip of the iceberg if we don't dig deep enough to get to why the youth is angry and misbehaving. This is the beauty of wraparound. You dig to the why. You look at what is the underlying drive that is leading for that person to act this way before choosing strategies to use. Here are the objectives for this module. By the end of the module, participants will be able to understand the different phases of wraparound, understand how addressing unmet needs from the family's perspective can assist in changing family dynamics and provide more meaningful help to them. Understand from the family's point of view their hoped for experience of wraparound. Understand the theory of change the wraparound process is based on. Let's take a look at Gabe's story that would be representative of a description of a youth in need of help. Please follow along while I read. Gabe is 16 years old and has been incarcerated in the juvenile detention center for domestic violence with homicidal ideation towards his adoptive mom and reported plan to harm her. He recently was found to have a weapon in his room. Recently, he had returned home after being psychiatrically hospitalized in the past month, but with little change in his behavior. Gabe was born with physical deformities related to his mother's overconsumption of alcohol and use of crack cocaine. He had some surgeries when he was younger to try and correct these issues. Gabe grew up in a large family and was severely neglected by his parents. They lived in the storeroom of a bar. He was subjected to physical and sexual abuse by his older siblings. While his mom was incarcerated, he was left in his father's care. During this time, he witnessed his father cut off another man's arm with a machete. When Children's Services was called to the home, he was found naked and his father having video equipment and pornography on the television. He was removed and placed in foster care. While in foster care, he experienced further abuse by older teens. From foster care, Gabe was adopted when he was seven years old 
along with his younger brother. His new mom had him in counseling for his earlier trauma. He was often withdrawn and not connected to others. He would get overstimulated easily and hide under the kitchen table in a fetal position. At this time, he was diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome, reactive attachment disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. He repeated the first grade but was able to continue through grade school on an IEP, though he struggled academically and socially. As the years went by, he continued in counseling and was able to pass on to other grades in the same school. When he had to transition to the freshman building in ninth grade, he hated it. He was in a learning disability classroom, but was bullied by his peers. He was removed and placed in another school and continued to struggle and began having difficulties with his teacher and principal there. He had an incident at school where he became aggressive after they took his phone which led to a three-week hospitalization. When he was 16, he started at another school and did okay for the first month, but then wanted to be homeschooled and refused to go. He had an online relationship with a girl who did not live near him, which he became obsessed with. His mom stopped his access to electronics, but he was able at times to find a way to access the Internet. As a result, he stayed in his room, would only eat by himself, and stopped showering. His mom was alerted to a plan of his to kill her, and police found he had a machete in his room. He was placed in the juvenile detention center. As an alternative to incarceration, they are seeking residential treatment for him. His mom says he cannot come home. On a scale of one to five, how much hope do you have for Gabe and his family, with one being not hopeful at all and five being very hopeful for him? From Gabe's story, we can see there are a lot of challenges he faces. It can be difficult being hopeful for him. In the wraparound approach to helping families, we explore how the family makes meaning from the adversity they face, how they think of themselves and the events that have occurred in their life, and their view of the world around them. In part, this comes in acknowledging their unique story and help them see the resilience and strengths they have. As a family feels understood by someone else and the meaning of things that have happened to them, they begin to recognize their resilience and their strengths. This, in turn, shapes how they act and the decisions they make as they move forward. In Wraparound, then, this understanding of the meaning of the family's life events shapes how we define the needs the family has. Let's revisit Gabe's story. When wraparound begins, the person who is going to guide them through the process, sometimes called the facilitator, meets with the family and listens to their story and explores their experience and impact of events in their lives, what worked for them, how they managed, and how they were helped along the way. The facilitator captures this into a short narrative or uses bullet points to retell the story. Here are excerpts from an example of how Gabe's story was told in addition to the initial description of him earlier in the module. Gabe is an almost 17-year-old who enjoys playing golf and is technologically savvy. Gabe's faith is very important to him and recently he has learned how to run the sound system for his church. Gabe has typically been family-oriented and had a desire to please others. Gabe enjoys playing board games, card games, and watching movies. The family enjoys the volleyball net in their backyard and enjoy riding their bikes in the neighborhood. They get along well with neighbors and are a close community. The family has a beagle who is nine years old a shepherd chow mix who is eight, two cats, and some fish. Mom grew up in same area as she lives now with a younger sister and her mom and dad. She said that as a child, her dad struggled with alcohol, and at 14 years old, her mom took them to a domestic violence shelter to get away from their dad. Eventually, Gabe's mom graduated from high school and was working as a nurse's aide at a treatment program 
when she realized her passion for recovery services. She began working with the children's program when she was 19 and became a substance abuse counselor and continues to provide substance abuse recovery services. When mom was older, she had a stepson with her partner. Her stepson is now grown and a successful chef. After this, mom gave birth to her son and she and her partner were together seven years. Her son now attends a Christian school and is involved in theater and martial arts. He is visiting colleges and hopes to major in history and minor in writing. She describes him as popular and smart. Gabe trusts him, and Mom is concerned that his going away to college is impacting Gabe. He has led Bible study and has given sermons. She sees Gabe looking up to the things he is able to do. A couple of years after her son's birth, Mom decided she wanted to adopt a child. While she was going through the foster care adoption classes, she saw a calendar with Gabe's brother's photo on it and she fell in love. Children's Services told her that his brother was in a sibling group of seven children and that they wanted to keep his brother and Gabe together. And so Mom happily adopted both boys when Gabe was seven years old and his brother was four years old. When Mom got the boys, she noticed a lack of attachment to others. It took them a long time before she ever saw them smile. Gabe did some counseling from age 7 through 8, but Mom primarily was working on her own with the boys on attachment. Mom said she was able to help them using constant reinforcement and building trust. Gabe struggled in school, and Mom held him back in first grade due to the number of schools he had been in in the previous year. Although Gabe struggled academically, his teacher always reported he was a pleasure to have in class. Since then, he has typically made B's and C's with the help of his individualized education plan. Gabe went to a Christian school from 6th through 8th grade and did well in the smaller school setting. Gabe has remained close to the pastor from the church associated with the school. Mom got together with her new partner after she adopted another son who was four months old. He is now eight years old and attends a charter school. Mom describes him as bright and charming. He enjoys soccer, basketball, and playing video games like Roblox and Mario. Gabe's mom and partner lived together for three to four years, and her partner has remained as godparent to the boy since then. They have continued to be close friends and good supports to each other. They attend the same church. When Gabe moved to ninth grade at the public school building, he did not like the school. Gabe was in a special classroom for kids with learning disabilities. However, he experienced bullying and would come home from school crying most days. In the winter, several years ago at the end of the first session, Mom decided to move him to a Christian school. Gabe did not do better there and began struggling with the teacher and principal. Gabe was very close to Mom's mother, who had recently died, and this was impacting Gabe greatly. In the spring, the following year, Gabe began talking with a girl online, and he was very involved and focused on this relationship. There was an incident with bringing his phone to school relating to the girl, where he got upset and aggressive about keeping the phone because he believed she was going to try and kill herself that day. At that time, he was sent to Children's Hospital due to his aggression at school and stayed for three weeks for evaluation. As a result of this stay, the doctors identified his past trauma as a major impact to Gabe's functioning. Gabe refused to participate in counseling, but was willing to begin vocational counseling with a local mental health agency as he wanted to get a job. He was also having one-on-one -on -one counseling with his pastor, who also helped Gabe learn the sound system at church. Gabe is very involved in his church, and he has an accepting community there. That summer went well. Gabe went to visit his aunt and uncle for a three-week vacation. Gabe gets along well with them. Gabe spent a week in camp, which he always enjoyed. Mom took the family to Florida for a week, which she described as calm and content. In the fall, Gabe started at the charter school. He was happy at school and was making friends. 
In late September, he started to refuse doing work at school. The school tried to implement things to help, like giving Gabe the opportunity to take a walk, use headphones while at his desk, and having an aide with him to prompt him to get his IEP accommodations. Gabe was still upset at school and wanted to begin homeschooling. Gabe refused to go to school, so Mom withdrew him and was hoping to get him to work on his schoolwork either at her home or with his godmother, but this did not happen. Mom now knows that Gabe had begun talking with another girl online, and he was saving his money to go and visit her. In October, Gabe would not leave his room, stop showering, and quit eating publicly with the family. It was later that his mom found out he had started to post statements of his dislike of her and the rules she put in place for him. Gabe has very concrete thinking and is an either-or thinker. He has conservative Christian, strong moral views, which make it hard for him to understand other people's choices at times. Prior to his incarceration and recent plan to hurt his mom, his godmother had the boys one evening a week, each one-on-one -on -one with her, and then every other weekend. His mom is engaged to a new partner, but they do not live together. Gabe's mom wants help for Gabe, but does not feel safe living with him at this time. She hopes she will find a way to meet Gabe's needs so that he can be safe and productive in life. She is hoping her family can heal and be able to have fun together again. Listening to this and the added details of Gabe's story, how does it alter your view of Gabe and the possibilities he and his family have? Knowing how they have dealt with adversity in the past, what strengths do you see? What are factors that contribute to this resilience? Again, on a scale of one to five, how much hope do you have for Gabe and his family, with one being not at all hopeful and five being very hopeful for him? In looking at Gabe's behaviors that are causing him and others problems, what would you say are his needs? One of the mantras of wraparound is, bad behavior comes from an unmet need. These underlying drives or needs we have explain why we are behaving in a certain way. Often these are under the surface, and if you want to change the behavior, you want to address the unmet need that is leading them to act this way. The tip of the iceberg is what we see, how someone behaves. Below the surface is our needs or drives, the why we are behaving that way. These may stem from feeling lonely, having been hurt, feeling abandoned, lacking confidence or needing reassurance, not feeling like you have a place in your family or peer group, not feeling competent to give some examples of needs people have. Therefore, in wraparound, the people involved with the person who is struggling will try and help them meet these needs in healthier or less problematic ways and will develop and choose the strategies that are targeting the underlying needs. Wraparound-like practices started as a way to have more innovation. When those working with families that were struggling and there was no clear way to help them make things better, they were given the opportunity to try something different in the late 70s and 80s. Youth who had complex needs and more intensive behaviors that families and communities struggled to deal with often ended up in residential treatment centers to try and help them. What often occurred is the youth stayed in these facilities for long lengths of stay, and it was difficult transitioning the youth back home successfully. As an alternative response, providers were tasked with coming up with other ways to help them that was more community-based and comprehensive. This led to further innovation in response to helping families as those working with the lessons they learned and applied it to other settings or tried to develop the ideas within various youth serving systems. These grassroots efforts led to the more widely used term of wraparound to describe this work. In the 90s to early 2000s, those who had been working in various settings doing wraparound participated in national forums or meetings to come together and formalize the practices and lessons learned into what has become the wraparound process. From this, the National Wraparound Initiative, or NWI, defined more clearly the philosophy and principles of wraparound, 
the four phases the wraparound practitioner guides the family and team through, and strategies used in implementing wraparound. For more information, you can find detailed history on National Wraparound Initiative website. Click on the National Wraparound Initiative if you would like more information on the history of wraparound, then close window and push the forward arrow to continue. So the wraparound process is one in which help is organized to address the needs of the family. It is one where an individualized plan is created, implemented, and monitored that addresses the needs of the family by the family and a team of their supporters. This collaborative process is driven by the perspectives of the family, the meanings they put on their life, and things that are important to them. A team of family members professional and natural supports, and community members develop this plan with the facilitator who understands the process. The plan builds on the strength the family has and their unique family culture. The facilitator ensures the process is driven by the needs of the family rather than what services are available or are reimbursable by some agency. This then ideally provides for a more flexible and comprehensive response to families. As the work of wraparound continues, persons speaking referencing the NWI motto and principles. The term wraparound is used by different persons in social service and related fields, sometimes with varied meanings. For those trying to implement the motto with similarity to the NWI philosophy principles and phases, they speak of fidelity to the motto, or high fidelity wraparound for those in close alignment with NWI practices and measurement tools of the model. The wraparound practice model, as described in these learning modules, seeks to be in alignment with the National Wraparound Initiative. Wraparound, though, is an aspirational model. It has developed out of the innovations of those trying to provide good community-based help to families that addresses their needs. As it's implemented, it strives to retain some of its nimbleness. These resources can be found on various sites. If you would like more information on formal evaluation tools of Fidelity for Wraparound, please click on the word Fidelity and then close window and push the forward arrow to continue. The wraparound practice model has been described in terms of four phases to describe the work of the facilitator or care coordinator, guiding and motivating the work of wraparound. The four phases are engagement and team preparation, initial plan development, implementation, and finally, transition. As wraparound has developed, there has been an expansion of roles to include both parent and youth peer support partners those having lived experience working with the youth serving systems. As a result, at times, some of the activities presented in the phases may be done by one of these other roles. Additionally, the phases are not exclusive of one another. For example, even though a lot of groundwork is done in engagement phase discovering family and team strengths, this work continues throughout the process. The elements in the transition phase, which are highlighted, are started with the work in engagement and team development. Click on the facilitator-led phases if you would like to read more on the phases of wraparound. Then close window and push the forward arrow to continue. During this phase, the groundwork for trust and shared vision among the family and wraparound team members is established so people are prepared to come to meetings and collaborate. During this phase, the tone is set for teamwork and team interactions that are consistent with the wraparound principles, particularly through the initial conversations about strengths, needs, and culture. In addition, this phase provides an opportunity to begin to shift the family's orientation to one in which they understand they are an integral part of the process and their preferences are prioritized. The activities of this phase should be completed relatively quickly, within one to two weeks if possible, so that the team can begin meeting and establish ownership of the process as quickly as possible. The hope during this phase is to establish a partnership with the family 
and a foundation for the rest of the work to be done. Ideally, collaboration and enthusiasm for the journey is created. Listen to one family's experience as they started Wraparound. I would just recommend Wraparound to anybody that's, you know, going through a rough time um, or having a situation where they just don't know how to handle it. Um, I don't know if I can be specific or not, but my son dealt with some major anger issues that we just didn't know how to deal with any longer. And um, it got to the point where after dealing with it for a couple years, we just were bogged down in it, didn't know what else to do, where to turn. And um, through the help of wraparound, it just really helped us, um, you know, make it through the situation and um, get him in a better place, get him the help that he needed. Um, it took some help that we didn't know that he needed to, um, we, we got that in, in place, but they were there with us and helped us through everything, uh, supported us through, you know, him getting in a little bit of trouble uh, in the meantime while waiting to figure out how to help him deal with the issues that he had. and. Um, it was just wonderful having that extra support and having somebody I could turn to if I had a question or didn't know what to do. It was just nice to have somebody that I can turn to that I felt safe talking to that wasn't going to spread my business all over town. Um, you know, somebody I could trust that I could turn to and help, you know, get, get the help I needed or just a listening ear sometimes. So I would recommend it to anybody that's going through a rough patch to, um, to let them help you with whatever it is you need because uh, it really did wonders for my family. Some important tasks for the facilitator in this phase include, the facilitator orients the family and youth or young adult to the wraparound process. The facilitator meets with the family face to face and explains the wraparound process in non-jargon terms and answers questions they may have. The facilitator confirms that they want to proceed with wraparound or discusses alternatives that may better fit their needs. If they want to proceed, the facilitator completes necessary consents and releases and explains the family's rights in wraparound. The facilitator will explore with the family any immediate crises or safety issues they may have so they can be addressed and they can move forward with the wraparound process. These issues could be aggressive or self-harm behaviors of family members or basic needs such as food or shelter issues. The facilitator works with the family to develop enough of a response to maintain safety or provide relief until the team meets and can provide additional supports or responses as necessary. Additionally, the facilitator helps facilitate conversations with the family and use their young adult to explore individual and family strengths, needs, culture, and vision the family has for the life they want for their family. This information will help the facilitator prepare a narrative and strengths inventory that captures important aspects of the family that will be used with the team in planning. The family will review the document for their approval. The facilitator engages other team members identified by the family. The facilitator is responsible for speaking with those individuals who are significant in some way in the family's life and have an interest in helping them make things better for them. The facilitator explains the wraparound process and talks with them about their potential role and participation. The facilitator elicits their perspective of the family and the strengths and needs they see. And finally, the facilitator makes arrangements for an effective initial team meeting. This will include checking on availability, time, location for the family, and the team members to be present for the meeting. The facilitator is responsive to the team to try and get the right people at the table respecting the family's preferences. The facilitator considers the need for supports such as child care or translators. The facilitator reserves the space as needed and prepares the necessary documents and posters as well as supplies for the meeting. 
The facilitator ensures that everyone is notified about the meeting in a timely manner. Phase 2, Initial Plan Development. During this phase, team trust and mutual respect are built while the team creates an initial plan of care using a high-quality planning process that reflects the wraparound principles. In particular, youth and families should feel during this phase that they are heard, that the needs chosen are ones they want to work on, and that the options chosen has a reasonable chance of helping them meet these needs. This phase should be completed during the first one or two meetings that take place within one to two weeks. A rapid time frame intended to promote team cohesion and shared responsibility toward achieving the team's mission or overarching goal. It may take several weeks to get the plan fully together as work in between meetings and researching options has to occur. During this phase, the facilitator helps the team produce the following an initial plan of care, a crises or safety plan, and complete necessary documentation and logistics for ongoing meetings. Developing an initial plan of care, the facilitator guides the team in coming together to form a team and set the foundation for the wraparound process. As a team, the facilitator guides the team in establishing ground rules around confidentiality mandated reporting, and creating a safe and blame-free environment to hold meetings. Review the family, team, and community strengths document or inventory and make additions or adjustments. Create a team mission statement that incorporates the family's vision into an overarching goal the team can work to accomplish until they transition from formal wraparound. Review the proposed needs list the facilitator has prepared and prioritize needs the youth, family, and team want to work on to achieve the team mission. Determine what the team hopes the outcome will be if need met and create indicators of meeting that need that will be assessed and measured. Brainstorm options and select strategies that will meet the targeted need, utilizing the family, team, and community strengths and that are consistent with family culture and values. Assign action steps that captures who is doing it and in what time frame. Creating a crises or safety plan. The facilitator guides the team in identifying any crises or safety issues and creates a prevention plan or proactive safety plan as warranted. Determine potential serious risks and prioritize response based on likelihood of occurrence. Create crises or safety plan, looking at antecedents to the crises, strategies to use, and potential responses, and specific persons and responsibilities for each type of crises or safety issue. Completing necessary documentation and logistics. The facilitator completes documentation for the initial plan of care and distributes it to team members. The facilitator completes logistics for time and place of next meetings and ways to contact team members. Phase 3, Implementation. During this phase, the initial wraparound plan and steps are carried out, progress and successes are continually reviewed, and changes are made to the plan and then implemented, all while maintaining or building team cohesiveness and mutual respect. The activities of this phase are repeated, until the team's mission is achieved and formal wraparound is no longer needed. During this phase, the facilitator helps the team implement the wraparound plan, revisit and update the plan, maintain and build team cohesiveness and trust, complete necessary documentation and logistics. Implement the wraparound plan. The facilitator guides the team in implementing the plan of care, monitoring completion of action steps, and measuring outcomes and celebrating successes seen. The team members implement action steps for each strategy in the wraparound plan. The team members track progress on the action steps in terms of implementation and discussing any barriers encountered. Using indicators associated with each need, the team members evaluate success of the strategies meeting the family's needs. The team members celebrate successes as action steps are implemented, indicators show progress, 
or positive events occur. Revisit and update the plan. The facilitator leads the team in revising the plan to improve meeting the family's needs and address need for new strategies. The team members consider new strategies as necessary when what they are doing is not working or when new needs are addressed. Let's pause here and listen to one parent's experience of her team. I, I don't think we could have asked for a better group of people. It's just that every one of them, you could see that it really wasn't about them, but what they could offer us that was going to help us. That's what I was so impressed with because I'm not a really smart person, but it was just like they kind of knew what we needed before we even had to ask what we needed. We just didn't know they were there to help us. So every one of them, they were very professional, but they were also very caring, very giving to us and our family, and understanding what we needed and what was going to help us was the biggest, the biggest thing. Additionally, in this phase, the goal is to maintain and build team cohesiveness and trust. The facilitator maintains awareness of team members' satisfaction and takes action to keep the team working well together. The facilitator maintains awareness of team satisfaction and buy-in through discussions with the team and orients new members as the process unfolds. The facilitator addresses issues of team cohesiveness and trust, continually educates team members about the process, and helps them work through conflicts or manage dissatisfaction. Complete necessary documentation and logistics. The facilitator maintains and updates the wraparound plan and attends to team communication and participation in team meetings to make them effective. The facilitator updates action steps and outcomes after every meeting. The facilitator discusses schedule, participants, location of meetings to ensure maximum progress in achieving mission. If new crises or safety issues have come up, these could also be addressed during this phase. Phase 4, Transition. During this phase, plans are made for a purposeful transition out of formal wraparound to a mix of formal and natural supports in the community and, if appropriate, to services and supports in the adult system. The focus on transition is continual during the wraparound process and the preparation for transition is apparent even during the initial engagement activities. Your team has done a lot of planning and discussion of what works for this family and what doesn't. It is important to capture this information so that other professionals and supports don't have to reinvent the wheel or repeat the same mistakes. It is also important to celebrate the work of the team and where the family is as they transition from formal wraparound. Additionally, the facilitator can develop a system to follow up with the family to see how they are doing. Listen to one family's reflection on their experience of wraparound. I really feel like wraparound as a program is very beneficial to families. You know, so often that we get caught up in our day-to-day -day activities and you, you have issues and we were really struggling and I look back to that time where we were then, where we are now, and wow, we've climbed mountains. And I don't know that we could have strategized and done it without the services that our parent um, support person and our wraparound facilitator gave us. I mean, they were there holding our hands from the very beginning until they did a big graduation for Cameron and um, it, it, we were all very proud because not only did he graduate and though that was the emphasis we did as a family. I mean, mm -hmm. we really made a lot of triumphs. Yes. During this phase, the facilitator will plan for transition out of formal wraparound, create a commencement or graduation, develop a system to follow up with the family, plan for a transition of formal wraparound, create a transition plan, the facilitator guides the team in reviewing strengths and ongoing support to meet need past formal wraparound. Create post-transition crises plan. The facilitator guides the team in reviewing and creating, as necessary, a crises prevention plan that is well-oiled and rehearsed. Modify wraparound process to reflect transition. The team discusses how they will respond to future situations and negotiates members' ongoing roles. Create a commencement. The team celebrates successes made in achieving team mission. 
Document the team's work. The facilitator guides the team in creating a document that summarizes the team's strengths, lessons learned about strategies that worked or didn't. Celebrate success. The team creates a culturally appropriate celebration that is meaningful to the family and team and acknowledges their accomplishments. Check in with family. The facilitator guides the team in creating a procedure checking in with the family following transition from formal wraparound and plan for having a meeting if needed or assessing services in the future. In summary, the phases and activities of the wraparound process, which we have laid out, provide a skeleton of the formal process. In the additional modules in this series, the phases will be broken out in greater detail along with the skills and competencies needed to implement the model. Rethinking Wraparound, Hello, Help, Healing, and Hope. In this article by Pat Miles, Mary Jo Myers, and John Franz, National Consultants in Wraparound, offer a perspective of the wraparound approach from the hope for experience of the family in wraparound. They describe the positive growth that occurs in relationships over time. If you would like to read the whole article, click on Rethinking Wraparound and when finished, close the window and push the forward arrow to continue. Hello. Initially in Wraparound, ideally the family experiences feeling welcome, which sets the stage for building a longer-term partnership with the family. This experience of hello is feeling appreciated for who you are and greeted with respect and feeling included. Persons practicing the model are to listen and seek to understand the family and their concerns and to provide comfort and respect for the urgency of their situation. The practitioner seeks to understand what happened to the family, what it means to them so they can ensure the right help will occur. Help. As the family and team begin to meet and wrap around, families with complex needs should experience getting real help for the concerns they have, not just that they have a plan in place. Wraparound meetings are the means to produce targeted help that is timely and is achieving the changes the family wants for themselves, the outcomes they want to see. Healing. As help is being offered, families in Wraparound will find the help useful and that it makes a difference in their lives. This leads to healing and improvement in the family situation. Sometimes what is offered misses the mark, but the team keeps their eye on meaningful outcomes for the family and a readiness to adapt until they get it right for the family. Hope. As families experience healing, hope begins to blossom. As the team keeps refining and delivering the help and celebrating the family's progress, families become more confident, empowered, and hopeful. They begin to see a future for their family that often they had lost sight of before they started Wraparound. Wraparound has been found to be helpful to families as the process is built on the premise that addressing the priorities that are most important to the youth and family, family voice, will improve their engagement in decision making and lead to better outcomes. The underlying logic is if you don't know what to do, you bring together people who have a vested interest in you doing better, a team, and build on what is working, strengths, and agree on a common goal, the mission. Who look to understand what is driving the situation you want changed, needs, and track what you are doing to get desired results, outcomes, until success is achieved, unconditional care. This approach unleashes the energy of the team which shares the work, collaboration, and leads to greater self-efficacy for the youth and family as they experience success. Wraparound Process and Theory of Change The wraparound process is based on principles and phases and activities of the process. When it is offered to families consistent with the model, it is characterized by high quality planning and problem solving, respect for values, culture, expertise of the family, team, and community, blending perspectives leading to collaboration among team members, family-driven, youth-guided structure and decision-making, provides for opportunities for choice, individualization of strategies or help offered, evaluate strategies to assess if meeting needs, 
recognizes and celebrates success. When these aspects of the process are working together, it leads to a positive spiral of greater self-efficacy for the family being served. It has been shown that this has led to better outcomes in the short and longer term for the family. These include greater follow-through on team decisions, service or support strategies that fit the family, service or support strategies based on strengths, improved service coordination, high satisfaction with and engagement in wraparound process, experiences of efficacy and success, enhanced effectiveness of services and supports, increased capacity for coping, planning, and problem solving, self-efficacy, empowerment, optimism, self-esteem, social support and community integration. It also leads to achievement of team goals, more stable home-like placements, improved mental health outcomes for youth and caregiver, improved functioning in school, work, and community, achievement of team mission, increased assets for the family, improved resilience and quality of life. If you would like to read further on the wraparound process and theory of change, click on Theory of Change. Wraparound works because of the various elements we have described work together to help families. That is the bottom line. It is a means, an approach that has been found to be effective in helping families with youth having more complex needs. In the following module, we will dig deeper into the principles that underlie the wraparound process that informs the practice model. Congratulations, you have completed Module 1, Why Wraparound?